it's a great pleasure really to talk to you about uh, what has been a most exciting project for us. And this is uh, a talk that myself and Chris Houston have put together. And Chris has been instrumental in a lot of the stuff, a lot of the tracking work that I'm going to be, be telling you about. So I'm going to be concentrating on cuckoos, but I'd like to just touch on, on some of the other tracking work that we've been doing. First of all, why do we need tracking? Um, we've got lots of information on birds breeding in the UK. We know about the demographics. We know annual survival. And there's a whole host of information that we can use there to try and understand why populations are changing. We've got a joint project between ourselves and RSPB and the BirdLife partners in Ghana and Burkina Faso looking at the winter ecology. So we're looking at the, the other end of the migrant story, so looking at the African situation. But we really need the bits in between to try and sort of square the circle and understand what's going on in between, in between the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds. And really the only way we can do this, or the way we can start to look at it, is by tracking. So we can get understandings about phenology, when birds migrate, where they go, where they stop over, um, and quite importantly, where birds die. <coughs> to understand why populations are changing, it's very important to have an understanding of mortality, where it occurs, and what's causing it. You can also do some interesting ecology, looking at the sort of environmental constraints on migration. You can look at habitat selection. So there's a whole load of stuff that you can do using tracking. There are three main technologies, and I'm sure that many of you will have heard about these. Uh, the first, which is, um, it's not a new innovation, it's been around for 10 or 15 years, but the devices have been getting smaller and smaller, and this is geolocators. And this uses light levels to work out where you are on, on the globe. So you have a, a timing of dawn and dusk, and you work out the time of local noon, and with an internal clock, you can then work out roughly where you are on the globe. And these are great, because they, they're down to about 0.6 of a gram, you get daily readings, they're relatively cheap, they're about 120 pounds. But there, there is a con with it. You need to catch a bird again, and the accuracy isn't great. GPS archival tags, uh, we've been using some of these on lesser blackback gulls. These provide extremely accurate information. So they have an onboard GPS processing unit, which then gives you an, a location accurate within a few meters. Some of the bigger devices have a Bluetooth download, so if you can get close to your um, uh, close to your bird, you can sort of remotely download the information. Where you don't have that, you have to recapture them, and they, these devices tend to be quite large, so we can't use these on pass, pass rounds. And then we come to satellite tags. Um, again, you have different versions of these. Some are more accurate than others, depending on whether there's a GPS chip on board. But the, the great thing about these is you can get a remote download. They beam the information up to a satellite. You work out where the bird is on the globe. You can get daily information for bigger birds, uh, for the cuckoos I'm going to be telling you about, we get information every third day. The cons, they're expensive, and the minimum weight at the moment is, is five grams. So you are limited on the size of bird that you can actually, actually put them on. Now, our tracking uh, started a few years ago. This is a, a study that uh, Chris and Chaz Holt did with the Swiss Ornithological Institute. And this was our sort of first taste of it. This is a, a track of a nightingale that we got. We... Um, tracked it from the UK down through France to a staging area in Iberia. Then we uh, followed it to its wintering area in Senegambia. Uh, sorry, through Senegambia into um, Guinea, Sierra Leone area. And this was the first time that anybody had tracked uh, a British nightingale to its wintering areas. We've been carrying on, and we've done some work on swifts. And this is one of the, the tracks from the, I think it's nine birds, eight or nine birds we've got back now. And this shows just the fantastic migration that um, uh, swifts do. They leave at the end of, end of July. They very rapidly through, uh, move throughout Europe. So by the uh, middle of August, they're in the Congo rainforest. So, so two to three weeks, they, they've left the UK and arrived in their Congo wintering areas. The birds stay around Central Africa. They, some birds move around more than others. Then they exit through uh, uh, the sort of Gabon region do this oceanic crossing uh, to uh, Liberia. They stage there for a couple of weeks and then head back up to the UK. And a bird can, can be in Monrovia one day and then five or six days later be back in its box <coughs> in the UK. And this is a bird that was tagged uh, with Doug Radford at the, uh, the Falmere um, Reserve. So tagging is, is really revolutionizing our understanding. This spring stopover site was, was not known at all. If you look on the right, you have a, a map of the ring recoveries of swifts. And it, the, in winter, and they map fairly well onto the, the winter track that we got. But if you look at 
uh, the spring ring recoveries, there's absolutely nothing in West Africa at all. And this stopover site seems to be absolutely crucial for all of our birds. And the project we're doing is part of a wider European project where um, people in other countries have put tags on swifts as well. So we, the plan is to put together a, a joint paper on migration or European migration of, of swifts. So my focus today is going to be on cuckoos, which have been an absolutely fantastic project. Um, I don't know if people have here would have seen them in the papers, heard them on the telly, but wherever you look, you seem to find uh, stories about, uh, about these cuckoos. Somebody even sent me a copy of the Jakarta Post in Indo from Indonesia, <laughs> and we had a full half-page article with a massive great photo of one of our cuckoos. So truly global coverage. Satellite tracking is great because it gives you unbiased information. You can get the complete annual cycle. You get migration routes, stopovers, wintering destinations. And if you sort of drill down into data, you can get some in interesting uh, information about um, how environmental conditions and certain events might affect uh, migration. So how do you do it? Well, first of all, you have to catch a cuckoo. That's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, I think myself as a ringer, I've never caught a cuckoo until I actually went out to go and try. So you don't catch them incidentally. So this is a typical cuckoo habitat, sort of quite open with bushes and, and trees around. And we've got a fairly w tried and tested method now, uh, which Paul Noakes, who's a ringer in East Anglia, um, uh, helped us out with. And there he is looking at things. And this is one of our, one of our secret weapons. <laughs> Not Justin on the right, but the, the, the stuffed female cuckoo on a stick. And she's very useful. So that what we do is we stick, um, Sticker in the ground, you have a one mist note up, and then you have a tape lure uh, with a female bubbling call and a bit of cuckooing uh, on it underneath it. And sure enough, when you do that, most times we caught cuckoos. I think we, I'm not entirely sure how many times we went out, maybe seven or eight, and we caught cuckoos on uh, most of those occasions. So it actually, when you put your mind to it, it's not actually that difficult. So here's Chris, and this is Casper Thorup uh, from Denmark, who came over to help us fit satellite tags. Casper's a, a satellite tracking expert, and when you're fitting harnesses to birds, you really need some expertise to uh, show you how to how to do it safely. So Casper coming across was incredibly, incredibly useful. So what we ended up with was five cuckoos that were tagged in East Anglia. Uh, here's Chris looking very pleased with himself. I think this is our third or fourth cuckoo, and here's Paul Noakes, who was a um, a very dedicated ringer in East Anglia, and he's helped us with uh, the swifts and, and the cuckoos. So what's the story so far? Well, we thought the cuckoos migrated through, uh, through Europe, went down through Italy, went across the Med into sort of central northern Africa, then migrated down to the Congo. And certainly by, I don't know, end of July, um, middle of July, this is what birds were doing. They were staging in this area here. And we've actually identified a number of staging sites, but the Po watershed in northern Italy seems to be uh, really quite important. <coughs> then one of the birds in southern France suddenly decided to go into Spain. And um, we thought, well, what's this bird doing? We've, we've never really thought the cuckoos did this. And it went down into, uh, into West Africa, stopped in Senegal, um, and we thought, okay, well, is it going to winter there? Is it going to sort of go down to the rainforests here and, and winter? But actually, it's moved across. And then the last bird to leave the UK did exactly the same thing, or very similar, albeit much later. So the two things we've, or three things that we've learned from this is that cuckoos leave very early. So we had birds leaving in June. You've got these two migration routes, and stopover sites in uh, northern Italy, southern France, seem to be quite important, and that they all are converging in this, in this area here. So if we look at a close-up of where the birds are, this was two days ago. All the birds are in or around the Congo rainforest. One has actually gone further south of the Congo rainforest is in the, and is in the southern savannas. We've got a number of birds banging in the middle of the rainforest, and we've got one uh, up here. You can't really see it. it's green, this green line here on the northern edge. And the birds seem to be doing uh, incredibly well, and I'm amazed that all the birds uh, are still alive. It's fantastic that the birds are all still alive. But I wasn't expecting that. I expected at least one to die on the way. So this is a close-up of uh, Chris the cuckoo. Um, he is in the middle of the uh, Congo rainforest. And Google Earth is a wonderful thing. It gives you some great information about what the birds are doing. So this is the, the Congo River, the biggest river in Africa, and this is one of its main tributaries. 
And I guess he will be in an area where you've got forest elephants and chimps and goodness knows what else. So he's probably having a great time uh, <laughs> doing a bit of mammal watching in, uh, in the central Congo rainforest, somewhere I'd, I would love to go. You can get some really interesting information about habitat use. So this was Casper, uh, the cuckoo. So we named one after, after Casper Thorup, uh, who came and helped us. And this is one of the areas they staged in, in northern Nigeria. And you can see this area of forest here. This is a forest reserve. And you can see these massive points around this forest reserve. And this is all farmland in the surrounding areas. These, these, these points are the points we get. They don't actually reflect the, uh, the accuracy of the, um, uh, the, the, the actual points. So that point there, just outside the forest, may actually be, in, be inside it. But we'll be looking at that in more detail in the future. Casper moved south to the Congo. And again, you can see this dark area here this forest area, and it seems that these areas of forest seem, are actually quite important to uh, cuckoos in Africa. So we're beginning to get some idea of habitat selection in, um, in Africa, something we really didn't know about before. If you look at where, when they move, um, the big surprise was that some started moving off at the beginning of June. We never thought cuckoos did that. Um, the surprise to me was that I thought birds would actually move quite, quite far south before they did the big Sahara hop, as it were. But actually, um, they all sort of staged in northern Italy, southern France, before, and then they started this massive migration. They didn't, some went just south of the Sahara, some actually went all the way to the south of the arid zone on the border with the humid zone in, in West Africa. One bird had a different strategy. It, it basically staged at the top of the Sahara in Morocco, jumped over, really did the minimum uh, distance it could to get across the Sahara, and staged in the north of the um, the arid zone. They all stayed in the arid zone for quite a while, and then they started dropping down into the humid, humid zone, and now they're all um, uh, in the humid zone quite close together. So this area, northern Italy, southern France, seems to be an important uh, stop, stop off site for the cuckoos. At one point, the cuckoos were 3,500 kilometers away from each other, and this graph here just shows the days after the 1st of June, and an estimate of the um, the variance in the longitude, in other words, how, how separate they were um, across uh, their range. So obviously on the breeding grounds, they're very close together. Uh, as they migrated, they got really very far apart, and now they're converging again on a particular area. So very different migration strategies uh, seem to be going on, not only in where they go, but also how they do it. So whether they take off from uh, northern Italy or Morocco, whether they go west or whether they go east. So out of five cuckoos, we've got um, some really very interesting and possibly quite confusing information. But it's, it's, it's fantastic that we've actually got this. We're getting some information on, information on stopovers. So this is degrees north here. So this is an idea of latitude. And these are just sort of locations. So this was uh, Sussex. And we had one bird stopping off in Antwerp docks for a few days. So it's just a tiny patch of woodland in the middle of the dock. And um, we sent Lyndon Kearsley to go and have a look, but he couldn't actually get in there for security or health and safety reasons, which was a shame. But um, anyway, it stopped off in Antwerp docks. You can see the stopovers are between sort of two and three weeks in this, uh, this area in France and Italy, uh, or in Morocco. And they've, they stayed up to about 40 days in the, in the arid zone after they crossed the Sahara before dropping back down into the humid zone. These are the graphs that I, I find fascinating, is just how far these birds have traveled. So this is, um, this is measured from point to point uh, on our tracks. Some birds like, like Casper, which went directly to the Congo, traveled about 6,000 kilometers, um, as did Martin and Chris. But these two birds, Clemens and Nister, which took the westerly route, have traveled up to 10,000 kilometers to get to essentially the same place. So they've, they've traveled maybe 3,500, 4,000 kilometers more than the other cuckoos just to get to the, the same wintering areas. So the future plans, um, cuckoos are in massive decline, and one of the reasons we're doing this is to try and understand what happens on migration. So we want to tag some birds in Scotland. Uh, if we can think we can do it, we'd like to do females. If any of our birds die, and they haven't died yet, we'd like to top up the, the Norfolk sample. Um, so we're hoping next year to tag a lot more cuckoos, especially in Scotland, and Scotland's our priority for next year, and that's what the raffle is going towards, um, uh, towards those tags. Swifts, we've um, put some more tags on this year. We're going to retrieve those. 
and get a, a nice paper hopefully on, on swift migration. Nightingales, we are going to be tagging uh, birds in Ghana this year. This is the joint RSPB, BTO, and BirdLife Partners uh, project there. We're going to tag some birds in Norfolk, and that will give us some good information on stopovers and phenology. And we would like to do other species. And we're thinking of, of other, other species to do at the moment and thinking about various collaborations uh, that we can make. But to do this, we need, we need funds. Um, this is just a bit of... It, it's, it's not a major... It's a bit of a plug, I guess. <laughs> the tags are £3,000, and that covers a tag and a year's worth of satellite time. And this year's satellite tracking project was covered by uh, BTO members from the Christmas Raffle, BBC Wildlife Fund, and Essex and Suffolk Water. And I'm sure many of you here have been Cuckoo sponsors, and Cuckoo sponsorship this year has been fantastic. We've been asking for £10 off people, the minimum donation of £10, and for that you get all kinds of things that I'll show you in a minute. And you can see the amount of money we've raised so far um, is up to sort of £11,000, which is fantastic. So that's enough for three satellite tags, or even four satellite tags maybe, uh, for next year. Our target's about 75K, so we've got a way to go, way to go yet. So if, you, if people would like to sponsor a cuckoo, um, I know Rachel will be here at the end of the talk and, or at the end of the session, and we'll be happy to uh, sign you up. You get a nice um, email newsletter every few weeks, or a couple of weeks, which updates you about the movements. And we're also selling cuckoos for Christmas as well. So if you haven't got the, all the Christmas presents and would like to give a Christmas cuckoo, uh, here you go. And we, we're selling gift packs of £25 for um, adults, which includes Mike McCarthy's book, uh, Say Goodbye to the Cuckoo. And for kids, we've got um, a very nice hungry caterpillar, very hungry caterpillar money box, because cuckoos need caterpillars, um, which is £20. So if you uh, would like to uh, buy one of those, Rachel will be happy to help you there as well. And this is just really to say that we've not been doing this in isolation. There are lots of people we need to thank, and um, a number of people and institutions have, have really supported us in doing this tracking work. Um, and again, I think uh, thanks to our cuckoos as well. Thank you.